Uh, I also want to welcome everybody who's watching online or listening to the podcast. It's great to have you as well. Uh, last week, we started a brand new series called The Final Hours. And the the kind of the idea of this series is to look at some of the final things that Jesus said to his disciples, his kind of closest friends, leading up to his crucifixion. And I just think the concept of this series is interesting and intriguing because if you and I only had a few hours left with our friends or family, what would we say to them? Now, obviously, we're not going to be crucified, but if you had 20 or so hours left, what sort of things would you want to communicate? You know, it's just, it's, it's a good thought exercise. What would be important and you want to make sure they never forget? What would maybe not be so important that in just the, the realm of everyday life, we make it a bigger deal than it really needs to be? What would we want to please, please, please never forget these couple things? Well, when it comes to Jesus, we don't need to guess what those are, what things he would talk about, because we actually get a written record of what happened. Jesus's best friend, John, the Apostle John, writes a biography of sorts of Jesus' life. We call it the Gospel of John. And in this document, John records these final, very personal, vulnerable, open hours that Jesus had just communicating with his friends. Please don't forget these things. Now, the setting is starts off at something we call the Last Supper. It's the last meal before the Passover celebration, big deal for Jewish people. It's a, it's a very somber sort of mood. Jesus, what we talked about last week, has just finished washing his disciples' feet, a humbling experience for everybody involved. And from there, Jesus goes on to talk some more to his disciples. Hey, these are the things I want you to know. And he says some just, I, I don't know, it's almost appears to be bad news sort of things. He says, hey, I want you guys to know one of you is going to betray me. Now, these group of, of, of 12 guys, man, they had just spent the previous three years ago. They left their life behind to follow Jesus, to become his disciple, or maybe another term for that today would be like to become Jesus' apprentice. And so they, they, had, they had spent lots of time together. They, they heard all of Jesus' teachings, and they had formed these bonds together with each other. They're almost like a family unit. You know, here's, here's 12 guys who spent all this time together, and we don't know this for sure, but I think it's safe to assume they probably had, you know, these, these little things, these inside jokes with each other, and these nicknames, and these special stories and looks that only they could share. You know, they, they had this almost brotherly sort of connection, and so when Jesus tells them, one of you is going to betray me, can you imagine how shocking that must feel? Can you imagine the like, what what time out, Jesus? What are you talking about? What do you mean someone's going to betray you? I thought we were a band of brothers together. I thought we were in this together. How could someone turn their back on you, Jesus? The, the shock and awe and like, what in the world must have been enormous? Then, as if that wasn't enough, Jesus goes on to say, not only is someone going to betray me, but also I'm going to be leaving you guys. And where I'm going, you can't go with me. Again, for the previous three years, for all intents and purposes, these guys have spent 24-7 with Jesus. You know, they walked with him from town to town and the, all the conversations they must have had on dirt roads. And they got to hear all the teachings and see all the miracles and sit around the campfire at night and ask very personal questions to Jesus. Hey, you were teaching on a hillside. Nobody got what that was. Can you please, you know, kind of share with us, what are you talking about? What do you mean by those things? You know, they, they did life with Jesus for three years. They were always by his side, always with him. And now he was leaving and they, they couldn't be with him anymore. Again, imagine, I mean, put yourself in their shoes. This is more than just, you know, a Bible story page. This is real life for these guys. Here is their leader. Here is their friend. Here's, in their mind, their political messiah. They thought Jesus was going to overthrow the Roman government and usher in a new era of Jewish superiority and like he was going to kick out all the bad guys and they were going to be the good guys just ruling and reigning, you know? And then Jesus is changing the plan that they thought was going to happen. It was the plan all along, but their, their expectation of how things were going to go is now falling apart. Everything they thought was going to happen now it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And I'm sure the disciples are starting to put the pieces together. 
I think Jesus is going to die. He'd been telling them for years, hey, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. I think the pieces are starting to start, finally talk, finally starting to align. And there is just this fear. There is this stress. There's this what in the world is going to happen, Jesus, if this goes like you say it's going to. And I think you and I in our, our lives, I think we feel those same types of emotions, you know? Now, obviously a different situation, but those core emotions, man, you and I deal with so often for a whole wide range of different areas. Some of us, we just feel stress, you know? There's, there, there, there's, there's, there's some uneasiness in our life just because of, you know, maybe a, a relationship that we had at one time with a, a family member, a friend. It was great and everything was awesome and something happened, something changed. Now that relationship is different or maybe even broken. What do we do with that? What does, what does life look like now that it's different and we get uneasy and we get a little anxious? I think some of us tend to feel these emotions maybe when we look at where we're at in our career or where our finances are at. We thought by whatever age we're at, we thought things would be different. We thought we'd be further along. We thought we'd have more money saved. We thought retirement would look different than it is. And what do you do when plans change, when what you expected to happen isn't what happens anymore? It's, it's natural for every one of us to feel some fear, to feel some worry, to feel like we're losing control of things. And how, how do we deal with that? I think a lot of us feel some of this uneasiness in life, these like troubling emotions. Maybe when it just comes to, you know, the state of our country and the economy and inflation and the election this year that all of us are just so thrilled and can't wait for, you know, like it's, it's natural to be like, what in the, we have no idea what's going to happen. What's the future of the country going to be? That's something that keeps many of us up at night. What direction are we going to head? What are our what are our nation's values going to be going forward? What's this country going to look like for our kids and grandkids? Is there going to be a country that we remember anymore? I think sometimes we feel some of this fear and anxiety, maybe because of a health issue that either we have or a loved one has that, you know, some, some, some disease is just, it's made life totally different. We never planned on it. We never wanted it to happen. We prayed it would go away, but you know what? It's still here. And how do we deal with the unknown? How do we deal with the fear? How do we deal with the uncertainty? There are situations we all face, just like the disciples did, where what I expected to happen didn't happen, isn't going to happen, doesn't look like it. And we got to be left with like, what now? That uneasiness, that fear, that tension inside. And Jesus says something to his disciples to directly address this emotion. He says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. Now, John didn't record this, but I imagine all of the disciples' jaws hit the floor. What do you mean don't be troubled, Jesus? That sounds ridiculous. You tell us someone's going to betray you. You tell us you're going to leave and we can't. How, what do you expect us to be, Superman? How do you want us to not be troubled? But this is not Jesus being dismissive of their emotions. This is not Jesus saying what you're experiencing isn't real. Instead, this is Jesus responding to them in the most loving way possible. You don't have to let this trouble overwhelm you. In fact, this is not even so much of just like a think happy thoughts. This is almost a command from Jesus. Stop it. I know what you're experiencing. I know the emotions, that's real, but stop being troubled. You don't have to let these situations and these fears and these emotions rule over your life. Why? Why would Jesus say something? It sounds almost a little insensitive. It sounds a little bit dismissive, but the reason Jesus said this is because of perspective. He goes on to say this. There is more than enough room in my father's home. Don't be troubled because this is real. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Yeah, hey, listen up. Yeah, someone's going to betray me. Hey, listen up. Yep, I'm going somewhere you can't go with. But don't be troubled because death is not the end. 
Don't be troubled because this isn't all there is. Jesus, during his final hours, is trying to get his friends to understand, to open their minds up to a bigger perspective than just their short few years on this earth. Don't be troubled because there's room for you. Don't be troubled because there's a place. Don't be troubled because I'm coming back. I think he would, I think he would grab his disciples if he had more time and say, listen to me, please. You don't have to let these emotions that you're feeling rule over you because this life is short, eternity is long, and heaven is real. That's what he's pointing people to right here, the reality of heaven. For many of us, we, we think of, if you, if you were to think of heaven or picture heaven, we, you know, we think of naked babies and harps and white clouds, you know? That's, listen, that's, that's, that's the Simpsons heaven, okay? That's not real heaven. Real heaven the heaven that God has prepared for us is so much better. When we put our trust in Jesus Christ to be right with God, heaven is our destination. Now, not everybody goes to heaven when they die. That's a message for another time. But when we put our trust in Jesus, we have to look forward to a real, tangible place. Heaven is a real, tangible place that is more awesome and amazing than our minds can even comprehend. It is more beautiful than we can even picture. Streets of gold and brilliant gemstones are just, you know, a way to try and describe this like, mm, holy moly, it is more, it, it is, it will be breathtaking how beautiful it will be. Heaven is a real place where there is no more politics, <laughs> No more inflation, no more money worries, no more crime, no more addiction, no more jealousy. Heaven is a real, tangible place where the Vikings win the Super Bowl every day. At least close to that, maybe. I don't know. That, that might be my impression. Heaven is a real, tangible place where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more anxiety, no more depression, no more hunger, no more longing for anything where we get to experience a perfect place, perfect relationships with God, perfect relationship with God. The, the, I mean, heaven is amazing and we will get to see our Savior face to face get to see and witness and be in this awesome. When Jesus was telling his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled, it's because of heaven, because of what they could look forward to after this life was done. Even though there were troubles, even though there were struggles, I'm going to prepare a place for you. His disciples didn't get it right away. You know, over the next 12 hours or so, there was still plenty of fear and you know, they ran away and Peter denied and all this different stuff. But I tell you what, a few days later when Jesus rose from the dead, and then a few weeks later after that when these early believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, man, their lives were radically transformed. Suddenly, what Jesus said during his final hours made sense and it changed their lives. In fact, Peter, who was here at the Last Supper, heard Jesus say this himself, years later would write his own letter to Christians in his time. And Peter says this, it's by his great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the foundation of Christianity. Look what God has done. And now because of that, man, we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that's kept in heaven for you, pure, and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. This is basically Peter's way of rephrasing what Jesus said earlier. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Look at this. Look at what we have to look forward to. Not that troubling situations don't come up. Not that we don't face, you know, challenging times. In fact, in the next few verses, Peter addresses that directly. I know you're going through trials. I know there's persecution. I know some of you, you have, have lost people who have been martyred for their faith, but guess what? 
We have a priceless inheritance. Don't forget what's coming. In fact, just a few verses later, it says, though you do not see him now, you trust him. The very thing that Jesus told his disciples to do, you trust in God, trust also in me. Listen, you can count on what I'm, on what I'm telling you. Peter said, you can count on this. And you rejoice with a glorious and expressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. It's the reward we get to enjoy a relationship with God now and forever. But like the physical part of it is this real, eternal, heavenly home for our souls. And it's not just, this is not just, you know, Jesus said it and then Peter said it. And it's just these isolated incidents. This mindset, this perspective on life is all over these New Testament writings. In fact, I want to read quite a few verses, just rapid fire, so that we can kind of understand how big of a deal this heavenly eternal perspective is. In a letter called 1 Corinthians, Paul says, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, man, we are more to be pitied than anyone else in the world. What a shallow type of faith if it's only about these 80, 90, 100 years here. In another letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, we don't look at the troubles we can see now. They're there. We go through stuff. Life doesn't always go the way that we planned, but rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now, the situations we go through now, the emotions we feel now, man, they are soon going to be gone. But the things we cannot see, heaven, in my father's house are many rooms. Those are going to last forever. In a letter to the Philippians, Paul says, to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. That sounds crazy. That sounds preposterous. Unless heaven, unless what Jesus said is really true, unless there is a place of eternal glory in the presence of our Father with nothing in between. I mean, can you imagine? Maybe dying really is better. He says to a a younger pastor friend, now the prize awaits me. When Paul was writing this letter, he was in prison. You know what physically awaited him at the time? Execution. Church history says by beheading. He didn't know when it was going to be or how it was going to happen, but I think he knew his life was coming to an end. He says the prize, the prize actually is the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. I know I'm about to die. I know I'm about to be executed, but you know what? That's that much closer to the prize than I am. What an incredible perspective. The author of Hebrews says, this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. And like I said, this is just something we could read dozens more verses in the New Testament about this longing and looking forward to and big picture view. Life is short. Eternity is long. Heaven is guaranteed for those of us that have put our trust in Jesus. But here's the odd thing. How come this perspective is not the perspective so many of us have? How come for many Christians today, many of us in the room, that's not how we feel? Now, if you're not a Christian, if you're listening online, you know, whatever, wherever, if, if you're skeptical, if you're not sure about the Bible, if you don't believe in Jesus sort of thing, I understand why you might have some fear, why there'd be a, some worry about what happens after we die. I get that. But those of us that claim to have put our trust in Jesus, doesn't it seem a little illogical to not share this kind of a perspective? Doesn't it seem odd? I mean, here's here's Jesus during the final hours of his life before crucifixion. Out of all the things he could have talked about, this was important enough for him to take time to remind his people, here's what I'm promising you. Here's what you can count on, friends. As we read through the rest of the New Testament, this promise of heaven, this assurance of salvation was a life changer for so many people. And yet, if we're honest with ourselves, it's not really so much for us, is it? Most of us, we don't fix our gaze on what's to come. We fix our gaze on the troubles of today. Most of us do not live with a glorious, inexpressible joy that supersedes any challenges we might face because we're still stuck in worry and anxiety and fear. 
Most of us are not looking forward to a home yet to come. We're more concerned about what happens in this life. And I just think when you look at what Jesus said, when you look at other things that we read in the New Testament, there just seems to be this gap between, I believe, where God wants us to be and where we often find ourselves. Me too. I think to to help get our minds around this, let me give you a super insignificant example, okay? In the 2022 NFL season, the Minnesota Vikings played the Indianapolis Colts at U.S. Bank Stadium, okay? If you watched that game live, like I did, it was very stressful. It was a quote-unquote troubling game to watch. Not troubling compared to most things we experience in life, but okay, in the world of the NFL. The Colts come in and they just score and score and score and score and score. And by halftime, the Vikings are down 33 to nothing, okay? My face was the same as everybody else's faces at halftime. Just this like, what in the world is going on? How come you can't play football anymore, you know? And they were, you know, the Vikings were getting booed going into the tunnel for halftime. I can understand watching the game live, how you'd have some hesitation, you know? how you'd feel a little uneasy about it. But how much different would it be today if we watched the game now? How much different of a perspective would we have watching all the fumbles and the punts and the bad plays? And yeah, they shouldn't have done that. But when you know we win at the end, it's a much more enjoyable game to watch, isn't it? You're not nearly as worried about the time that they try and punt and it gets blocked and run in for a touchdown. Who cares? Because you know what? The Vikings completed the largest comeback in the history of the NFL. I don't care anymore. You know, I still watch that game now and I just have so much more peace watching it today than I did watching it in the moment. In fact, I turned it off in the moment. So I think that's the sort of perspective. And, And here's the thing. How foolish would it be if, if, if we were to sit down and watch the game together? How foolish would it be to get all bothered that, oh, the Vikings fumbled. I wonder what's going to happen. I mean, how silly would it be to think, oh, they punted again. Uh-oh, we're down 33 to nothing. I mean, just logically speaking, it would not make any sense to be fearful of what the final score was going to be. We already know the final score. The Vikings win 39 to 36. Shouldn't it be that same way in our lives? Not that we don't face troubles. Not that we don't go through situations where things don't work out the way that we thought they would or that we wanted. But in the end, we win. Jesus already won. Let's live like that, you know? I think another way to think about it Imagine you and I, we lived, our, our existence was a million years. Now, we are created as human beings to live for all eternity. A million years is infinitely shorter than that. But for the sake of math, let's go with a million. If every year of life was one page, do you know how tall that stack would be? You know how tall a million pages is? It's about 350 feet. To give you some context, the top of that screen right there is about 18 feet from stage to there. That is about 20 times taller. A million pages stacked on top of each other would be 20 times taller than that screen. And if you and I, by the grace of God, live to be 100, it's about that many pages. Now, this is real life. Stuff happens. Things don't go the way that we want. Come on, this is such a short book. Compared to eternity, what could happen here? Not being dismissive, not saying that what we go through isn't a struggle, but I think Jesus would look at us and say, don't let your hearts be troubled about what happens here when we've got so much more to look forward to. This life is not all there is. How do, we, how do we get that perspective? 
I mean, how do how do you and I, how do we genuinely learn to live with that type of view? Because it's one thing to sit in a room like this or listen to a podcast. It's one thing to read a Bible verse, but what about today when you go home and that trouble is there? What about tomorrow when you go to work and that trouble is there? What about Tuesday you go to the doctor and you hear news that you didn't want to hear? What do we do in those moments? How do we live with this type of perspective? I tell you, it's, it's maybe the most conceptually simple thing to do. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Here's the key. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. It's not a magic bullet. I'm not saying it's a light switch sort of, you know, instantaneous thing. But the more time we spend with God, talking to him, sitting in his presence, reading his word, pondering, you know, worshiping, whatever it is, the more we just think about heaven, the more our perspective grows. It, it, it's just the natural result. The more we daydream about heaven, the more we long for heaven. The more we think about different aspects, the no tear, the beauty, the seeing Jesus face to face, when we think about those things, the more our desire for heaven grows. And you know what? As our, as our perspective, our desire grows, the troubles we face in this life start to lose their grip. Not that they go away, not that they vanish, but they start to lose their grip on us and our hearts don't get as troubled as easily. I mean, I've, I've found this to be true in, in my own life. These to me are some of the most transformational verses I've ever read. God has used them to produce change in me that is that is awesome. I still face struggles. There are still times when I get depressed and worried and fearful, but it's almost like I, I, I have this, this foundation that doesn't change because of it. There's this overriding sense of peace because of the reality of heaven, because of what Jesus purchased and secured for us. And I just wonder like, what, what would that look like for you in your life? whatever you're going through, whatever struggles and challenges you might have, what would it be like to have a, a hope, a, not a finger-crossing hope, a secure hope, a confident hope, a perspective that says whatever it is, isn't all there is. There's some of us that we're just struggling in life right now, you know? Struggling with finances, struggling in our career, struggling with the relationship, Maybe our kids are struggling at school, struggling to make ends. I don't know, just struggle's a real part of life. Will thinking about heaven physically change any of those struggles? No, that's not a realistic expectation. But will thinking about heaven change us in the middle of those struggles? Absolutely it will. The more we think about heaven, the more we, I don't know, insulate ourselves, I guess, the more God insulates us from the, the fears and the anxieties that can wage war on us. Some of us, we're just living with disappointment, you know? Life didn't turn out the way you wanted. Maybe it's disappointment with, you know, uh, uh, you wanted to be married and you're not. You wanted to have a kid and you can't. You wanted to be in a different home, but interest rate, you know, whatever the reason for disappointment is, if we're honest with ourselves, there's just disappointment we're dealing with. Is thinking about heaven going to magically make you married or kid or have a new house? No. But what if thinking about heaven could lift us out of that disappointment? Could at least help give us some, some better ways to deal with that in our hearts? Yep, that's real and disappointed, but thank you, God, that this life isn't all there is. Can, can you imagine being disappointed that you can't pay your mortgage if you know tomorrow you're winning the Powerball? Like, I don't care. Send me a late notice. It'll be fine. You know, I'm going to be a multi-billionaire in just a few seconds. It's that same sort of thing. With anxiety, with depression, maybe some of us are dealing with some very serious 
mental health struggles. Paul wrote in Philippians to think about things that are true and good and noble and pure and that that we would experience a supernatural peace because of it. Part of that is just being connected to God, but also part of it is God helping us to have a bigger perspective. You know what's true? This life is not all there is. There is plenty of room in our Father's home. When we put our trust in Jesus, it is secure for every one of us. Even, I think, for many of us, the idea of death. It's a scary thing. Death of a loved one, even our own mortality, that can be something that causes a lot of anxiety and worry. Unless we know it's not the end. Unless we know that there is a glorious, inexpressible inheritance waiting for us. That this life is a vapor. This life is a midst. We have a God who loves us and desires a relationship with us and sent his son to make us right with him now and welcome us into his presence for all eternity. I'm telling you, that reality can change our lives. The song we ended, you know, we, we sang this morning at the very end, it's called Give Me Jesus. And, and I just love that final verse. When my breath returns to the God of life, when, when our time on this earth is over, man, and I'm standing there wrapped in heaven's light, finally step into eternity. We'll be face to face. And the things we cannot see will fade away, but the, th- the things we cannot see will last forever. It'll be turned to sight. Not just reading on a page, not just hearing about it, but man, we'll be there. And all will be satisfied. My song, my prayer is Christ. The more you and I spend time with God, the more that changes from just song lyrics to a reality we can actually live in. And so as we close out the service this morning, as we wrap up our time together, we actually have some time to just sit with God. And so I just want to lead us in a prayer together, give us an opportunity to just sit in God's presence. I don't know if you want to bow your heads or sit back or however you pray to God best. But let's just, let's take a few moments and let's just, let's do what Paul wrote in Colossians. Think about the things of heaven. Father, I don't think we will ever understand fully the depths of your love for us how much you desire to be with us. Thank you for sending Jesus so that we could be right with you. Thank you for making a way for us to be reconnected with you right now and also, God, for all eternity. Thank you for the assurance of heaven. Father, I want to admit to you, we we want to tell you from our own hearts We don't always think that way. There are often things in this life and in this world and real struggles that we face that cause us to lose sight of eternity. Father, I just want to, we just want to tell you what those things are in the quietness of our own hearts. God, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm dealing with. This is my fear. God, as we release those things to you, I ask you, Father, for me, for every one of us, give us a bigger perspective. Help us see the reality of heaven. God, I invite you through the Holy Spirit. I don't know how you do this, but God, we want you to change us on the inside. Help us to see life from the proper perspective. Help us to fix our gaze not on just today, not on just momentary troubles, but Father, help us to fix our gaze on the eternal home you have prepared for those of us that have trusted your Son.
God, we can't make ourselves feel glorious, inexpressible joy, but you can. You can share with us your very presence. You can, you can help us see a broader perspective. God, I, I want to ask you for me, for every one of us, help us to experience and live with more joy because of you, because of what you've done, because of what you've promised. Those words that Jesus spoke during his final hours, don't let your hearts be troubled. God, I pray today and tomorrow in this next week, in this next month, and I, Father, honestly, if you could for the rest of our lives, help that be truer for every one of us. That even though we go through troubles, even though life doesn't turn out the way that we thought all the time, Father, through your presence and through the reality of heaven, may you protect our hearts from being troubled. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.